good afternoon life is a journey and we are the navigators of our own destiny good afternoon a warm welcome to this this satellite navigation and indian prospective virtual on virtual talk myself supriya naika hosting this program this is 97th episode of creative online talks it is it is a pleasure to have all of you join us from different corners connecting through the power of technology to engage in meaningful discussion and share knowledge creative creative is a group of people who are eager to gain new knowledge creative means cre means creativity active means activeness to be active we need creativity knowledge is knowledge square is our tagline sharing of knowledge increases our knowledge focus of creative is to build constructive thinking on various domain our main focus on non textual non academic non syllabus related concept every saturday we organize online talks on the zoom platform and we live stream our program on our youtube channel creative gbd creative is thankful to all our resource person for engaging us with their knowledge satellite navigation has become an integral part of our lives revolutionizing the way we navigate and positioning ourselves on the earth i hope this uh, this talk provides you more insight and understanding of satellite navigation and its latest advancement I call Divya, creative volunteer, to introduce today's speaker. Over to Divya. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, one and all present here. I am Divya, volunteer of Creative. I am here to introduce our today's chief guest, um, T. Subramanya Ganesh sir. He obtained an engineering degree in electronics and communication engineering from the Tantai Periyar Government Institute of Technology. affiliated to university of madras in 1997 he also obtained a master degree in satellite technology from the department of aerospace engineering from in iasc bangalore in 2004 uh, shri t subramanya ganesh sir has been working with the isro telemetry tracking and command network istrac in 1997 and worked in the field of mission operations and health analysis of Indian remote sensing satellites and has been closely associated with IRS one C or technology technology experiment satellite TES and Resource Sat one satellites. In two thousand seven, he was appointed as a project manager of the Navig ground segment. He was part of the team that was responsible for the design and implementation of the ground segment for ISRO's first ever satellite navigation project. In 2012, he was appointed as a deputy project director of the IRNSS Network Timing Facility, realization of an indig indigenous Navic training receiver, Navic time transfer receiver, tri-band Navic reference receiver, tri-band antennas, and operationalization of the state-of-the-art indigenously designed time scale system are some of his notable achievements. In 2016 he was appointed as a deputy general manager of the ISRO navigation center and timing facility he headed a team of 20 engineers and headed the research and development initiatives for the navigation ground segment in 2022 he was appointed as a project director for the prestigious asian Inst india space cooperation project with the envisis settings up of ground station and a data processing facility in the asian region in 2023 he was appointed as a deputy director of the navigation systems area of istrac a post he is currently holding shri t subramanya ganesh sir is currently pursuing his phd degree and has over 30 national and five international journal publications to his credit two of his papers have received the best paper awards this is all about our chief guest and i am welcoming you sir for this session and i am welcoming all our participants and volunteers and i am welcoming supriya ma'am thank you ma'am for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you divya over to you sir 
thank you uh, one and all uh, i hope i am audible yes sir okay so uh, i will right now uh, disable my video so that uh, we can save bandwidth yeah so before i proceed with my lecture uh, i need to uh, acknowledge uh, the efforts of mr srinatha who was instrumental uh, in bringing me to this platform i am also thankful to uh, ms supriya naika for uh, giving me the support uh, so that we are here and uh, i hope uh, you are able to see uh, my presentation also yes sir all right so i'll just go ahead so what is navigation um my professor at the indian institute of science he gave me a, a definition which i have never forgotten uh, uh, so far he said navigation is the art of sensing a state parameters of a craft from within a craft he was an aeronautical he was an aerospace engineer so he gave me an aerospace definition uh, uh, pure time uh, aerospace technical definition so navigation can be looked at as uh the uh, the uh, engineering or the branch of engineering which basically tells you where you are uh is it so difficult that you actually need an engineering uh, branch to tell you where you are it is because once you are in space there are six degrees of freedom you will have to know your latitude you will have to know your longitude you will know you will have to know your altitude and sometimes you will have to know your orientation uh, orientate let's say you are in an aircraft or something like that where you are headed whether you are headed north south east west up down so basically there are six degrees of freedom uh, so in technical parlance we call it as roll yaw pitch and then you have uh, uh, north east uh, and down or north east and zenith so six degrees of freedom uh, are involved and therefore you actually need a lot of uh, engineering a lot of uh, instrumentation a lot of technology to basically locate where you are so who were the pioneers of navigation if you look at this question the pioneers of navigation and the word navigation itself which is said is derived from the word nav and gati uh, in the other uh, you know it's two sanskrit words nav and gati basically means uh, nav means uh, boat and gati means speed so basically uh, the sailors were the pioneers of navigation so can you imagine or i don't know if you have ever traveled on a, in a ship i have at least traveled in a ship from chennai all the way to port blair that was in 2004 after a, a few hours once you are into the uh, sea there is just vast expanse of water and ocean everywhere it's it's a really uh, you know a bewildering situation actually because you do not know which is east which is west which is on a cloudy uh, day you are absolutely lost so i really salute uh, the brave soldiers of this world who uh, went about risking their lives and finding out the various sea routes it is said that uh, there was a lot of uh, trade between india and uh, and uh, the uh, middle east and the uh, european nations uh, way back all this uh, happened uh, with the uh, help of the uh, road transport or uh, the uh, the surface transport that happened uh, that that existed between these two continents so there was always uh, uh, you know an endeavor by the uh, european uh, explorers to find a sea route and columbus actually uh, went about uh, trying to find out a sea route to uh, india and accidentally discovered america and eventually it took vasco da gama uh, to find a sea route to india so these uh, sailors were basically the uh, pioneers of navigation so they had all sorts of uh, um, um, navigational aids to help them navigate across the seas and uh, during the world war uh, the use of radio frequency uh, increased dramatically uh, and then you had the uh, use of aeroplanes and fly and uh, other other uh, uh, equipments like missiles which had to be navigated so i let's say i have to uh, basically fly an aeroplane from all the way from europe to let's say some some city in asia then you have to navigate that across the sea so you you needed a lot more instrumentation lot more situational awareness in the aeroplane so a lot, lot more technology was developed the use of radio frequency uh, use of microwaves um, uh, improved a lot during the uh, world war and the post world war so navigation basically took a big stride and then um, uh, we came to what is called as the satellite navigation so 
basically finding out your position or finding out your position and velocity and time at any given point you can define it as navigation so if you are able to do that with conventional navigation aids let's say like a, a magnetic compass you are able to find out which is north or let's say with the help of uh, some uh, milestone so let's say you are near a very very famous building so therefore you know uh, where you are so this is these are conventional methods of navigation or you, let's say uh, you you can use uh, some celestial objects uh, like the sun or the stars to find out where you are these are called as these techniques are called as celestial navigation but let's say if you use satellites and uh, you consciously use them for navigating yourself then it is called as satellite navigation so uh, the first ever uh, satellite based navigation uh, was again a, a coincidental discovery uh, i'll just spend a, a couple of minutes on this particular uh, anecdote uh, way back in 1957 there was the big space race between uh, the ussr the erstwhile ussr and usa and ussr won that race by launching uh, what is called as the sputnik satellite Uh, into a low earth orbit and uh, this satellite had basically a small monopole antenna and uh, uh, it had a basically a, a small oscillator which was generating a certain frequency and then this frequency was just being broadcast so a few scientists at the uh, applied physics laboratory john hopkins university were uh, monitoring this frequency and uh, they observed a small shift in the frequency then they gathered that it was basically because of the doppler uh, shift that was happening because there was a relative motion between the spacecraft and the earth uh, and therefore uh, with the help of the doppler uh, they were able to actually estimate where the satellite is and where it could be after some time so uh, then somebody came up with the bright idea if that is so then uh, if we know the satellite's position very accurately and we are able to estimate The, the the doppler frequency shift that the satellites uh, broadcast is able to give us and we have some 3 4 or 3 or 4 such satellites then we can actually trilateral our position on the earth so the, this concept of trilateration and uh, using the uh, the doppler shift for finding out uh, the uh, uh, for aiding the trilateration uh, the first satellite navigation system was introduced uh, and its name was uh, transit and then uh, then came up uh, uh, some other uh, systems like timation the uh, the navy navigation satellite system and so on and so on b21 there was another project and then finally uh, the joint program office was commissioned in the united states in, in 1978 they came up with the constellation called the global positioning system which is very famous today so uh, gps basically has heralded the advent of satellite navigation now why is satellite navigation uh, so attractive what are the advantages one advantage is that it's always available to you satellites if you place them in the orbits and uh, make them work they are going to be available all the time to you so you know where the satellites are so with the help of the satellites and their downlink signals you will be able to, and if you are equipped with uh, proper receivers which can uh, receive those signals and process the signals you can you will be able to find out your position so it's available to the, the capability to fix your position is available 24 by 7 all weather service uh, it doesn't matter if it is a rainy day cloudy day sunny day it's going to work anyway and uh, with the kind of uh, improvements that we have made with respect to the clocks which are there in the satellite the clocks have become more stable more accurate so we are able to get very high accuracy on the ground today we are talking about with uh, advanced techniques sub centimeter or uh, not sub centimeter centimeter level accuracies uh, on the ground that means uh, if i am exactly at a position let's say x y z i will be able to fix my position with the satellite uh, navigation receiver to an accuracy not exceeding to an inaccuracy not exceeding a uh, few centimeters so this is the kind of regime that we have actually come and uh, satellite navigation uh, the other advantage is it's a global system so once you have a gps receiver whether you go to the north pole or the south pole or you are at the equator or you are in the ocean you are in the sky you can always get your position so this is another advantage of satellite navigation that it is a global system so uh, uh, if you look at any satellite navigation system like i said uh, the uh, the united states came up with the global positioning system the gps the russians came up with their own system called glonass uh, the uh, europeans have come up with a system called galileo and uh, the japanese have come up with a system called qzss quasi zenith satellite system the chinese have come up with a system called compass and now it's been renamed as bidu 
so there are multiple satellite navigation systems and uh, each of these satellite navigation systems basically has three common factors every satellite navigation system has a space segment so there are some satellites there are some transponders in the satellites the transponders broadcast certain frequency certain signals in certain frequencies this is common to all i may broadcast in in one frequency somebody else may broadcast in somebody in some other frequency but the fact is that i have a transponder and i broadcast a signal in a certain frequency is common to everybody so the space segment is one common uh, denominator across all satellite navigation systems second is the ground segment once you launch a satellite it's imperative that you uh, manage these satellite systems you keep these satellite systems in a certain working condition you ensure that the satellites are broadcasting signals the way you want them to be broadcast and you ensure that the users are receiving the signals in good health from the satellites so that is the responsibility of the ground segment the responsibility of the ground segment is to ensure that the satellites are in good working condition they are broadcasting signals which uh, which are safe for the users to use and they are uh, delivering correct information so this uh, responsibility is with what is called as the ground segment this is again a common denominator across all satellite navigation systems across the world be it gps glonass galileo bidu or uh, fusedesis third is the user segment who is the uh, end uh, user of this satellite navigation system it is people like common uh, people like you and me so uh, uh, let's say uh, i am very hungry right now and uh, i have a swiggy app in my mobile so what i do is i i, I access the application i i say uh, no um, I, i would like to have uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, vegetable biryani uh, from this particular uh, hotel i i made a, make an order then uh, swiggy automatically tracks my order then it ensures that there is a, a an executive who picks up uh, this particular order from this hotel and the executive exactly knows where i am residing so he navigates himself uh, to my place and hand delivers it uh, to my house so this is possible uh, because of satellite navigation system so so the user segment uh, is is basically consisting of uh, people and applications and uh, you know it could be a, a road based application it could be a marine application it, uh, it could be a soul a sailor who is in the sea uh, who is trying to use uh, the gps system or the satellite navigation system to uh, basically dock at a particular harbor it could be a pilot uh, who is uh, using the uh, the satellite navigation system to uh, to land an aircraft uh, uh, rightly uh, at an airport it could be anybody it could be an aerial platform it could be a marine platform it could be a land based platform but these are the various users and the users contribute to the uh, user segment so this is uh, these three segments are common to all satellite navigation systems i hope i am able i am making sense to all of you uh, uh, if there are any questions probably you can uh, stop me and then uh, ask your question also is it okay can i continue continue sir all right so like i said uh, these are the uh, various uh, uh, satellite navigation systems they are also called as global navigation satellite systems which means it is a satellite navigation system and uh, the gps glonass galileo bidu uh, have about 24 to 30 satellites uh, they are in orbits called as medium earth orbits and therefore uh they are global in nature that means uh, you could use a gps receiver across the world you could use it in united states you can come to uh, europe use it you can come down to australia use it you can go to antarctica and use it still uh there are a few uh, navigation systems satellite navigation systems which are called as regional navigation satellite systems the quasi zenith satellite system of japan is uh, is a regional satellite navigation system primarily intended to improve the availability of satellite navigation in and around japan similarly india has come up uh, with a system called navic or the navigation with indian constellation it's a constellation which is uh, designed uh, developed realized and operated by the indian space research organization and this is also a regional navigation satellite system so it's a satellite navigation system but it's not available globally but rather available in a limited area in and around india so 1500 kilometers beyond the indian indian geopolitical boundary to be very precise that's the area in uh, 1500 kilometers beyond india it's where uh, you know your uh, navic uh, service availability can be assured so it's a regional navigation satellite system 
So I'll skip the slide. It's a very busy slide. So how does this? Uh, how do? How does this work? What is the uh, fundamental principle uh, behind uh, the uh, satellite navigation system? So I try to explain very uh, simply. It's it's basically a very simple concept. So you are looking at uh, this diagram where it is uh, shown that there is a satellite called SV1, Space Vehicle 1, Space Vehicle 2, Space Vehicle 3, and Space Vehicle 4. Four satellites are available. You are a person holding a receiver on the surface of the Earth. You can see that Earth there, and uh, you are a person holding your mobile. Your mobile is having a GPS receiver or a satellite navigation receiver. So the satellite 1, SV1, says at a given point of time, hey, look, my position is X1, Y1, and Z1 at time P, and he sends a signal to that effect. So there is a distance of P1 between satellite uh, SV1 and the user, and this signal, which was transmitted by the satellite at time P, takes a little bit of time to reach the receiver, which is you, who is standing on the surface of the Earth. At the same time, at the same time, another satellite, which is SV2, which is which is completely you know in a different direction uh, and in a different uh, place, he says, "Hey, look! When the first satellite was at time t, my time also was t, but my position was x2, y2, z2, and he transmits a signal carrying that information. Similarly, SV3 and SV4, which are the other two satellites which are visible to you, standing uh, for you who is standing on the Earth, they send their position and their time." The only thing is, all these positions are referred to a single coordinate frame, and all the times in all the satellites are all synchronized. That means, uh, the uh, let's say you, you have four different clocks uh, sitting on these four different satellites. All these clocks are ticking at the same time. Tick, 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 tick. All the four ticks happen at the same time. So they're all synchronized to one uh, time. So they show 11 o'clock together, they show 11.5 together, 11.10 together, 11.20 together, and so on and so forth. So they're all synchronized very accurately to nanosecond uh, level, and they are ticking at the same time. And their positions, somehow they know, and they are broadcasting their positions. So once this kind of a scenario is enabled, you can use uh, the Euclidean distance formula, uh, like I have shown here, uh, to basically find out uh, the distance between yourself and the satellite one. For example, if your position is x, y, z, which is unknown, let's say uh, the receiver's position is x, comma y, comma z, which is unknown, the satellite's uh, satellite SV one's position is x one, y one, z one, then. And the distance between satellite one and uh, the receiver is P1. Then we can write the equation, Euclidean distance formula. P1 is equal to under root x1 minus x user the whole square plus y1 minus y user the whole square plus z1 minus z user the whole square plus the small bias which is there in the time because the receiver time may not be synchronized with the satellite time. Satellite says at 11 o'clock I send the signal. At that time, if the receiver also was at 11 o'clock. Then he would have, let's say he receives the signal at 11 o'clock, one minute. Then I can assume that the signal has taken one minute to travel from the satellite to, to the receiver. But for that, the receiver's time and the satellite's clock should have been aligned. If they are not aligned, then you will have to add this new variable, which is BU. So basically, here there are four unknowns in this equation. If you look at this equation, P1 is equal to under root X1 minus XU uh, and so on. You have four uh, user, uh, four unknowns. Uh, the uh, x of the user, which could be the latitude, for example, the y of the user, which is the longitude, uh, for example, the z of the user, which is uh, the altitude, for example, and the time bias of the receiver with respect to the satellite navigation system. So these are the four unknowns that you have. So fortunately, I have four different satellites uh, which are visible to me. So therefore, with each of, with, with each of these satellites, I can actually frame four different equations like this. Therefore, I have four unknowns. I have four equations. I can definitely go ahead and solve it. So the matrix uh, uh, notation that you see uh, on the, uh, the bottom is basically the, uh, the four simultaneous equations converted into state space notation. And then once you, uh, you, you solve it, you, know, you linearize it, and you can solve it using a computer, you basically get your x user, y user, and z user, which is your position. So if you know, Four, if you have four satellites above your head, whose positions are known and which are all time synchronized, and they send signals to you, and if you have a receiver which is capable of receiving those signals, processing the data that is broadcast by these satellites, 
then you can construct basically four circles and see the intersection of those four four circles and then solve for your position okay so this uh, is called as trilateration or triangulation and this is the fundamental principle on in which uh, the uh, satellite navigation works so if you are uh, good on this principle then uh, i think i'll uh, i'll basically uh, move to the uh, the, the next uh, few slides so let's talk about the Indian perspective. That's the, uh, the theme of this talk. So I just gave you an introduction about what is satellite navigation. So we said satellite navigation means basically navigating with the help of satellites. We talked about the various different uh, uh, navigation constellations which have been established by different countries. So what is India's response? India came up with this response. Uh, so in 1999, we decided that we should definitely have our own indigenous self-reliant navigation satellite system. And the formal project approval for this came something like uh, somewhere in, uh, in 2006, seven time frame. And in about six years from there, we conceived the entire satellite navigation system. We designed uh, how the satellite should be, how the ground segment should be. We realized the ground segment and uh, we launched the first satellite, which was called as IRNSS 1A. So this project, NAVIC, was originally called as IRNSS, standing, meaning uh, Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. So I told you NAVIC is a regional navigation system. It's not a global satellite navigation system. So we conceived this as an Indian, uh, as a uh, regional navigation satellite system. And uh, it, it had about seven satellites. So like I said, uh, the GPS, GLONASS, Galileo all have around anywhere between 24 to 30 satellites. Now, such a system, such a global system would have cost us enormous amount of money. In, in today's cost, it would cost us anywhere between 15,000 to 20,000 crores. Now, we did not want to spend so much money. We thought we should have a regional constellation with an optimal cost. And therefore, we decided that we will not go for what is called as medium earth orbits and go for enormous amount of uh, number of satellites. Rather, we thought we will place satellites in what is called as geostationary and geosynchronous orbits. The advantages of being in this orbit is it's always visible to a given region. So we place them in geosynchronous and geostationary orbits. And we made a lot of studies, made a lot of simulations, and we found out that if I place seven satellites at very special locations, then uh, the area that I was targeting, India and 1,500 kilometers of the neighborhood, will be completely covered by this constellation. And if you have a navi, if you have a receiver which is capable of receiving uh, the signals from these navig satellites, you should be able to navigate anywhere in this service area. So with this idea, we conceived and uh, realized the navig constellation. Uh, so uh, in, by 2018, the full constellation ha had been uh, arrived at. So we had all the satellites in place by 2018. So uh, what were the objectives? Uh, first of all, I did not want uh, the satellite navigation system to be owned by any other country. GPS is a wonderful uh, navigation satellite system, but the Department of Defense owns it. So during times of war or during times of hostility, they can switch off their signals. They can encrypt their signals so that you cannot use them. They could corrupt their signals so that you get actually erroneous positions. If, if they just screw uh, mess with their satellite navigation system, you know, all positional based or uh, location based services like your Ola, your Swiggy, your everything that you can name will all go for a toss. Your Ola will take you to a completely new uh, uh, location than the intended location. So this is the, uh, the power that the GPS has. And therefore, the Indian government recognized this. And we said, we decided that we should not be, no matter how friendly uh, uh, our dispensation is with anybody, we should have our own independent navigation satellite system and navic was uh, basically uh, brought about uh, because of that fundamental requirement of self-reliance and what was the other technical objective was that our accuracy should be better than 20 meters so if i should not make an error of more than 20 meters when i'm making a fix so uh, some this is like uh, i am i am in the ground floor of the house uh, all i can say is i am in the second floor of the house or um, something like that so I should not make an error more than that. So it should be as accurate as that. With these two objectives, we built about a constellation like this. So you're looking at the world map, or the, the globe, and then you have the, uh, the, uh, the geostationary orbit, which is uh, marked here, which is uh, 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 parallel to the Earth's equator. 
and and uh, the the numbers that are mentioned here are the longitudes of the earth so we placed a geostationary satellite at 32.5 east longitude uh, we placed two geosynchronous satellites at 55 uh, degrees longitude we placed one satellite at 83 degrees longitude couple of them at 111.75 and one at 129.5 so these are seven satellites four of them are in geosynchronous orbits you can see a figure of eight there at 55 111.75 they are not geostationary. They are not. Uh, the orbital plane is not parallel to the equator. Rather, it is inclined to the equator at an uh, inclination angle of 29 degrees. Whereas the orbits of the three satellites uh, placed at 32.5, 83, and 129.5, it is parallel to the equator. So they go around the equator. Whereas these two, uh, these four satellites, they go inclined. They go in an inclined orbit around the Earth. So with these seven satellites. And brought these satellite, seven satellites broadcasting navigation signals like it is depicted in the uh, diagram. Uh, and India and 1500 kilometers beyond the Indian geopolitical boundary, marked by that uh, dotted circle, would be able to get navigational service. So, if you are in a ship, if you are in an airplane anywhere here, you could use a navigation receiver and fix your position. You could know where you are. Basically. Or let's say you are moving from one place to another. Let's say you are moving from Delhi to Jaipur, you could use a navigation receiver and uh, navigate yourself to uh, where you want to go. So this was the uh, concept with which uh, the Navic constellation was uh, conceived, realized and operationalized. This is the timeline in which uh, we brought about the satellites. Very, very aggressive uh, program started. Uh, the first satellite was launched somewhere in uh, July 2013. And in about a matter of five years, we had all the seven satellites launched. The complete constellation was in place at various places, some of them geostationary, some of them geosynchronous, like I said, and the position, uh, the position information was now available to the user. The user had to use Navic uh, receivers uh, to fix his position, and he did not have to depend on uh, the GPS. That's a great advantage. So if you were to look at the top view of uh, the Navic constellation and uh, the uh, Indian region from space, this is how the constellation would look like for, uh, for a viewer from space. So what are the uh, segments of uh, NAVIC? So like any other uh, system, NAVIC also has three segments. The uh, space segment consisting of seven satellites, the ground segment, enormous uh, infrastructure uh, developed on the ground. And then there is a user segment, which is still dormant, uh, slowly picking up. But I am sure this constellation, NAVIC, will be able to touch one day, not very far from now, 1.5 billion users that's the target that means we want every mobile in this country to be uh, having navic receivers everybody uh, every mobile user to be using navic uh, services for his location based requirements we want every automobile or we are already there we are going very aggressively there every automobile every uh, strategic vehicle like an airplane or a ship or a, a helicopter to be equipped with navic receivers and to be navigating using Navic satellite navigation system. So this is the objective with which you are doing. The, the road ahead is, is pretty exciting, actually, because there are so many things that we need to do that has been done for the GPS, but they are yet to be done for the uh, Navic. And therefore, they are very, very, uh, what you can say, challenging uh, for, uh, for our country. But once it is realized, uh, we should have our own independent operational self-controlled, uh, accurate navigation system. So as far as the space segment of Navic is concerned, uh, like I said, there are seven satellites. And each of these satellites basically looks like this. In a stowed configuration, you are looking at the solar panels, which are stowed. You're looking at the satellite, which is there, uh, which was um, fabricated and uh, designed and developed at the URO Space Center in Bangalore. So this was the first satellite. It weighed about uh, 1.4 tons. And, uh, and uh, it was launched on a PSLV vehicle. And uh, the idea was that you uh, um, uh, basically, PSLV was an operational vehicle at that point of time. It is still an operational vehicle. Uh, but PSLV can carry uh, a kind of uh, not exceeding a mass, mass not exceeding uh, two tons to low Earth orbit. Therefore, we had to uh, reduce. Uh, the uh, payload mass to around 1.4 tons. So that was the idea. And all the seven satellites were launched by PSL. 
so what were the signals that were being broadcast by the navig satellites so uh, like i said the satellites once they are in space they have to broadcast certain intelligent information so that the users can receive those signals and process them and try to find out where he is so what are the satellites basically broadcasting the satellites are basically broadcasting this is my position this is my time my position is this my time is this this is what the satellites are basically broadcasting but there are also a certain other uh, uh, value added parameters which the satellite is broadcasting but the fundamental information that the satellites are broadcasting is at this time i was here at this time i was here at time 11 o'clock my position was 1.2 comma 3.1 comma 4.6 something like this the satellites are always broadcasting so they are broadcasting in two different frequencies one is called as the l5 frequencies which is happened to be in the l band 1176.45 megahertz the other frequency uh, other uh, broadcast is happening in the s band uh, which is in the 2000 to 3000 megahertz band and the exact frequency which which the navigation uh, navic satellites are broadcasting the s band frequency is 2492.028 megahertz they broadcast two services one is called as the sps or the standard positioning service which is a use which is a free signal unencrypted signal uh, and is usable uh, by any common user then there is a restricted service which is an encrypted signal which is available only for an authorized user so the authorized user just as how your dts system does not work without the password or a passcode the uh, the rs signals and the rs receiver will not work with a certain without a certain authorization so this is done so that only strategic users or the users intended to use those signals are going to use the signal so there are two uh, types of services there is a civilian signal for whom we have a open signal unencrypted clear signal and then there is an authorized user or a restricted user for whom we have another service which is encrypted but both these services are provided are uh, were provided in the first generation on two frequencies namely l5 and s yes. and uh, in the coming years the this constellation uh, will definitely be enhanced there will be more number of satellites than 11 than 7 and there will be new additional downlinks like i said uh, the first generation satellite broadcast signals in l5 uh, and s frequencies the next generation already is going to broadcast in l1 and i am expecting uh, a lot more frequencies to be added in the in the coming years so the l1 is 1575.42 megahertz that's the frequency in which gps operates that's the frequency where glonass and galileo and vidu also have signals so it was very difficult to coordinate this l1 frequency which was already being used by these uh, the, the other earlier operating uh, satellite navigation systems uh, but our team at isro headquarters they did a lot of coordination and they got this frequency band cleared for use by navig so that navig can actually use it so now with the same antenna that you can receive a gps signal you can also receive the uh, navig signal that's the advantage of being in the l1 band so we have three downlinks so the second generation satellites have three downlinks namely the l5 the l1 and the s band three different frequency bands but let's skip this uh, some of these uh, slides so uh, what are the the navigation data that the uh, satellites broadcast satellite ephemeris satellite ephemeris means satellite position so the satellite is saying i am at x1 y1 z1 and what is my satellite clock means uh, basically my position my my time sorry uh, so I, i am at x y z at what time the position of a of any given thing does not have any meaning unless it is correlated with the time i was at this position means nothing but i was at this position at this time means something so that is why in india so space and time are actually correlated so uh, in the indian culture uh, is very very significant the word kala actually means time the word kala also means emptiness or darkness so or emptiness or darkness is also space so the same word was used for both space and time and this was symbolized by the mahakaleshwar temple uh, in ujjain which is exactly at uh, the 83 degrees uh, meridian which i i believe uh, it's my belief of course uh, that it was the original uh, greenwich meridian or the zero degree meridian of the world 
so this is anyway my belief you don't have to give too much credence to it but uh, it is very uncanny that many of these uh, uh, indian temples are exactly located they were brought up at various times they are exactly on this uh, longitude which is the 83 degree longitude so uh, that's about it so so the the primary navigation parameters which the satellites broadcast are the positions of the satellites which is the satellite ephemeris and the satellite time uh, which is the clock parameter so satellite says my time is this my position is this and he keeps on doing that and along with that he also sends a lot of secondary navigation parameters which help resolve many of the errors that you actually face in the system so we'll not talk about that in a talk like this so once you have the satellite position and the satellite time then and you receive the signal after a certain time and you have like that information from four different satellites you can use those four equations which i uh, talked about a little earlier and trilaterate your position and find out your latitude your longitude your altitude and your time and that's exactly what the, the receiver in your mobile or the receiver in your automobile does so it does trilateration using these parameters and solves for your position so going to the ground segment so the ground segment uh, is like i said is responsible for the satellite upkeep maintenance of the satellite in the right orbit estimating the positions of the satellites satellites are broadcasting their positions but they do they really know it they don't know it it is the ground segment which continuously tracks the uh, satellites identifies where the satellite is and then uplinks that position information to the satellite so satellite like a parrot it keeps repeating my position is this my time is this so the actual intelligence is in the ground segment the ground segment with the help of various facilities like navigation centers timing facilities ranging stations data communication network it maintains or it establishes very accurately the positions of the spacecraft aligns all uh, the uh, clocks on board the satellites to a common time frame it it maintains a precise timing facility which is a very high precision timing laboratory uh, i do not know if you are aware of this indian standard time is maintained by national physical laboratories new delhi so they maintain atomic clocks and they maintain indian standard time so that is recognized that time is recognized world over as the indian standard time now even the navigation satellite system has a precise timing facility which has atomic clocks which are stable in the short term and stable in the long run long term also they use these atomic clocks to fix the time and make all the satellites get aligned to this time so because all the satellites have to broadcast this information at the same time otherwise satellite navigation will not work satellite navigation will not work if different satellites are referenced at different times it only works when they are all referenced to the same platform the same um positional platform or the same coordinate frame when i say my position is 1 comma 1 comma 1 for one satellite and 3 comma 3 comma 3 for some other satellite we assume that they are all in the same coordinate frame uh, then only it makes sense then only satellite navigation will work and when the satellite is saying i am at this position at 11 o'clock it is understood that every other clock in the constellation or all other clocks of the satellites are also at 11 o'clock otherwise this is not work so fundamentally the ground segment ranges performs the ranging operations to the satellite establishes the orbit determination of the satellites very accurately and maintains time synchronizes all the satellites to this time and ensures that the satellites are broadcasting their correct information with respect to the position and time so that the users can receive those signals trilaterate their position and get to know where they are so this is are the elements of the ground segment which are responsible for ensuring that the satellite navigation system works so with the kind of uh, establishment that we have done for the navic uh, system seven satellites a lot of infrastructure on the ground navigation centers precise timing facilities ranging stations data communication network all that put together and our objective was the user should not make an error of more than 20 meters but then when we actually made the system realized the system check what is the kind of accuracy that we were getting we were getting better than 10 meters uh, 
that means the maximum error that i was making in my system was not exceeding 10 meters and as far as the timing accuracy is concerned we were the timing error that i was making in the receiver was way below 40 nanoseconds so very very accurate i want you to imagine nanoseconds nanoseconds is 10 power minus 9 of a second in other words you could say it is one thousandth of a billionth of a second i do not know if it makes sense one trillionth of a second rather second is there if i divide it into trillion uh, pieces one piece would be one nanosecond so the error that i'm making uh, with respect to uh, the uh, timing that i'm able to receive with respect to navic is not exceeding 40 trillions of a second so that's really a fantastic kind of accuracy so the uh, precise timing facility had to be established i had to have my own time because i need to synchronize all the satellites time to this time so what we did was we actually had an ensemble of multiple atomic clocks such as active hydrogen masers passive hydrogen masers cesium clocks we assembled them and then we derived the time as a weighted average of all these clocks so that one clock will one clock failure will not be detrimental for the system then what we did was we steered our time to indian standard time so whenever indian standard time tick our time also tick we were otherwise a replica of the indian standard time when i say my time scale got steered to indian standard time that means i'm basically creating a very high fidelity replica of the indian standard time so that was generated in the ground and that became the reference for me to synchronize all the satellite clocks synchronizing all the satellite clocks is a very complicated engineering and mathematical exercise because it's very difficult one clock is in space one clock is in the ground suppose i have uh, two watches and you ask me to synchronize those watches i can bring those two watches close to each other i can look at the time of one clock one watch i can adjust the time of the other watch synchronize both these watches but let's say if these clocks uh, are actually separated by 36000 kilometers one is on the ground and one is in space aligning them synchronizing them is a significant challenge so we uh, there had to be a lot of mathematical uh, exercises mathematical uh, modeling mathematical uh, computations that need to be done isro developed all of that mastered it and today we are able to synchronize the onboard clocks the satellite clocks to the ground clock to an accuracy of a few nanoseconds this is manifesting because same error that i'm making uh, in the alignment of the space clock to the ground clock will be the uh, the error that the user will be experiencing in his time so because the error is not the error that the user is not experiencing is not exceeding 40 nanoseconds we are fairly confident that we have aligned the space clock to the ground clock very accurately So I'll skip this slide. It's a little uh, technical slide, so I'll just skip this. So uh, we have to know the uh, the orbits of the satellites. Like I said, the satellites do not know where it is. The X, Y, Z of the satellite. When I when I'm flying in an airplane, uh, there are lots and lots of uh, equipment inside the cockpit, which helps me to find out my position in an airplane. So in an in a air in a spacecraft, it is very difficult to find out your position uh, very accurately. So we use ground-based uh, ranging methods, uh, one-way ranging, two-way CDMA ranging, and laser ranging methods to establish the orbits of the satellites very accurately. And with the help of uh, uh, these ranging measurements, we are able to uh, estimate the orbits of the satellites very accurately and then uplink these positions of the satellites back to the satellites so that the satellites can keep broadcasting their positions and their time so that the users will be able to receive those signals and with the help of the receivers know where they are by trilateraling their position so uh, we have uh, the, uh, the navic system time that is the reference time that is used for the navic system is actually aligned with the indian standard time to a very high accuracy so it is always like i said in the bottom of the slide maintained within a, a window of 10 nanoseconds so any point of time the difference between indian standard time and the navic time that you get on your receiver is not going to be far off by 10 nanoseconds so what, what virtually you are giving you indian standard time uh, in your mobile so this is the advantage of the satellite navigation system is 
that it can actually bring Indian standard time, very high accurate Indian standard time to your doorstep. Uh, so uh, realizing this, we have developed what is called as timing receivers. And these timing receivers are now giving the reference to a variety of services within the organization and sometimes to various other uh, national requirements also. And then we have also developed what is called as the web-based uh, messaging service, which is a messaging service. So if you want to uh, send a message uh, to, a, let us say, a fisherman who is, on, who is in the sea on a ship or on a boat, you can actually use these messaging services offered by the Navic satellites uh, because the Navic satellites uh, have a capability to broadcast a certain message. Uh, you could get registered with uh, ISRO. Then once you are a registered user, you could actually uh, send this message uh, to the navigation uh, center. From the navigation center, it gets uplinked to the satellite. The satellite can broadcast that message to the, to the fisherman who otherwise is not accessible via your telephones or via your mobile phones. So, uh, so this is another uh, innovation that we have done with respect to the, uh, the navigation service. We are able to give them messaging service also. So if there is a tsunami alert, or if there is a high wave alert, or if there is a cyclone alert that I need to pass on to the uh, fisherman who is already in the sea, I could use these messaging services and then pass on this information very quickly and uh, in a life-saving manner. <coughs> Coming to the user segment, variety of users are mushrooming all the time. You have the Navic messaging receiver, which I'm showing here in this slide as NMR, so that they are being used by the fishermen. Now, the uh, Department of Road Transport has made it mandatory since uh, April 2022 that any vehicle that you buy, today if you buy an automobile, let's say you buy a car or a SUV, it has to be enabled with uh, a Navic tracker. It's, it's a mandatory requirement by the government of India. So it's also going to become uh, shortly um, possible that all mobiles have to be enabled with Navic receivers. So you have UAVs, you have uh, atmosphere, uh, railway systems, power grid, all coming up and trying to use Navic. So a host of applications are mushrooming. They are still not realized their full potential. But once they realize the full potential, Navic will become a, probably a very important strategic national infrastructure serving the various scientific, technical, strategic, and common uses of this country and the, uh, and the nation at large. Uh, so I'll skip some of the slides. So you have a few Navic chips available. Suppose uh, you are in a college and you would like to build a Navic receiver. You uh, you need to have an antenna and you need to have a Navic chip. One of them you can buy probably and then uh, try to build your own receiver, maybe using an FPGA or, or uh, some electronic components. Uh, so these are uh, some of the Navic chips which are available. Uh, we have published our signal in space uh, ICD. How our signals are going to be there, we have published in the website. Looking at that, they have built small receivers chipsets, and these are commercially available chipsets. Just like you have uh, GPS chipsets, you have Navic chipsets as well. So uh, the, the short messaging services, uh, I already mentioned about this, they are being used uh, by people in distress. And uh, we have a variety of mobiles. These are the kind of uh, the mobile systems that are actually Navic enabled. So. Uh, in the long uh, run uh, or not in the very far future, there, there would be a situation where there could be a lot of uh, uh, users who would be using Navic for a variety of applications, location-based applications, scientific applications, uh, strategic applications. So this is uh, going to be a reality uh, in the near future. We already have uh, these uh, systems in place. So we are looking at a very, very exciting uh, future. And uh, when we in incorporated advanced techniques like real-time kinematics, we were able to get very, very high accuracies. What was generally around five to six meters kind of uh, uh, accuracy suddenly became better than one meter. That means I'm able to give a position with an error of not exceeding one meter. That's a phenomenal uh, kind of uh, 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 what do you can say, performance. So uh, these are the, the telecom uh, standards. All these kind of uh, standards uh, have uh, accepted uh, Navic as uh, an international uh, navigation satellite system. And we have managed to enter into all these standards. And uh, 
we also will be uh, shortly putting up uh, the navic advisory so if there is any satellite that is not usable we will let you know through a website and uh, the latest gossip or the latest grapevine or the latest uh, information from our side is we have launched the next generation navic satellites which we are calling it as nvs of the navigation satellite navigation satellite 01 has been launched it was launched recently in sri kota uh, on may 29 uh, by the gslv the satellite will become operational uh, in a small in a short time frame from now and uh, the advantage of that satellite is apart from broadcasting l5 and s yes, uh, navigation signals it will also be broadcasting the much awaited uh, navigation signals in the l1 frequency and similarly we have other satellites uh, coming up nvs 0 2 3 4 5 it will be launched over the next few years and uh, the other great advantage other great miles uh, um, what can say, achievement that i would like to uh, uh, basically tell you is that the like i said the satellites have very high accurate clocks they are called as atomic clocks uh, the first generation satellites basically had imported clocks now we went about building uh, indigenizing these clocks and uh, we are very happy to tell you that the nvs01 has in fact an in house developed indigenous atomic clock so all the critical technologies which are required for running a satellite navigation system india has developed uh, over the last few years so starting 2006 so we have the ground segment where a lot of technology has been uh, uh, indigenized we have the time scale systems the reference receivers the cdma modems all getting indigenized even the atomic clocks for the ground also are getting indigenized we have the satellite segment where uh, the critical technologies like uh, the atomic um, the clocks the navigation transponders they're all indigenized as well so not only the uh, operation and control of the satellite navigation system the the design development and the realization of the satellite navigation system is also uh, very much in tune with what is called as the atmanirbhar bharat so india today isro today can proudly say that we have the capability we have the mastery over the development of what it takes to make build operate uh, a satellite navigation system, be it the space segment, be it the ground segment, be it the user segment. And uh, in the years to come, uh, when our satellites and our clocks are going to become more stabler, more uh, accurate, uh, you could expect the accuracies of the uh, users for Navic to become um, much better. From the current five meters, we are poised to give you more accurate information. So you could use it, actually use it for high precision applications as well. So that's all I have uh, for uh, this evening. Uh, thanks very much for your uh, patient hearing. Uh, I'll be very happy uh, to take questions if there are any questions. Thank you, sir. If any questions, you can. I am giving option to unmute yourself, and uh, you can. Yes, sir. Sir, you can unmute, sir. Out. Yeah, good evening to everyone. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Saravanan from SATCOM. Um, currently, I'm very happy that uh, navigation uh, uh, satellite system uh, fully of India has expanded its uh, services. And uh, recently, NVS-1 also is launched by ISRO. So then I, I was expecting this opportunity when sir used to uh, give advertisement that, okay, he will take a, a navigation segment seminar, but I uh, somehow I lost those opportunities. Uh, today I could uh, get the time, opportunity to listen to sir's uh, teachings. Uh, so really I am very much uh, mind blowing mind and um, happy to listen to your class. I understood fully the navigation system uh, only one question basic question i have sir like uh, you said that uh, the atomic clock at the ground is has to be synchronized to the uh, space segment that that's where the navigation system works so in between the how uh, our system corrects this uh, propagation uh, delay that is transmitted from the ground segment to the space segment sir thank you sir Okay, so uh, what I said was there is a timing system on the ground. The timing system uh, on the ground is basically uh, uh, generated using an ensemble of atomic clocks. 
and this timing system will be the reference system for everybody else be it a ground station or be it the space uh, segment be it the uh, uh, on board atomic clock all of them have to get reference to this uh, time uh, timing reference so how do i do that is the satellites basically broadcast certain signals the signals are timed in such a way that if there is stick in the atomic clock the satellite sends a signal so i know exactly when the uh, the signal started i know the distance between the satellite and uh, the uh, timing facility so the signal should take let's say t seconds to reach but it has actually taken t plus uh, delta t to reach so now i know that delta t is the misalignment between the ground clock and the uh, on board clock now i command the satellite i i do some tweaking with the satellite in such a way that the delta t becomes zero so this is how i basically adjust so but now i am making it very simple to you i am saying a signal came uh, then i found out that it was delta t but the signal when it passes through the ionosphere the ionosphere is going to refract it because these are all l band s band signals when it comes through the troposphere the troposphere is going to actually add delay to it so you will have to basically work out or identify what is the error that has been induced by the ionosphere what is the error that is induced by the troposphere remove all these errors and then you will exactly get the actual range between the satellite and the ground station or the timing facility then you estimate what is the delta t misalignment between these two clocks and then you basically tweak the onboard clock you don't generally tweak the frequency of the clock but you basically do some uh, uh, manipulation of the satellite clock so that's that the satellite clock tick aligns itself with the ground tick so in a lecture like this i will not be able to uh, basically elaborate the techniques but i'm just giving you the basic physics of the uh, the uh, uh, the problem i hope i i answered your question and uh, graph from mr ganesh yes sir team was from uh, thank you sir prepared uh, group letter you are see here this uh, nvs uh, will it work on uh, existing mobiles with any with uh, suitable upgrades by the vendors uh, so uh, basically like i said sir uh, many uh, uh mobiles are today enabled with uh, navic chips uh the uh, navic had a slight disadvantage the first generation navic had a slight disadvantage because uh the frequencies were one octave away from each other the first frequency was in l5 band 1176.45 megahertz the second frequency was almost an octave away 2492.028 megahertz but in nvs01 we have managed to bring in another l band signal which is 1575.42 so that's what makes nvs01 very attractive uh, so with an existing gps antenna you can actually track navic antenna also navic uh, signals also so that is the advantage of the new generation uh, navic satellites nvs01 is still not operational probably by end of this month you, you can expect it to be operational so once it is operational with uh, with a simple uh, gps antenna you could actually track the l5 and the l1 signals of nvs and uh, use it along with gps and one more advantage of the navic satellites is they are interoperable with gps that means you actually let's say there are only two visible uh, gps satellites and only two visible uh, navic satellites you could actually use all four of them as though they belong to a single constellation and fix your position because we enable what is called as interoperability so uh, this interoperability uh, helps us to be interoperable with other satellite navigation systems so to answer your question more precisely nvs01 could be used from the beginning of next month uh, when it will be completely made operational for a user to track it and find out his position thank you sir so, you can take dr sita question it is written otherwise she can ask sita uh, ma'am you can directly ask the question ah uh, thanks for the wonderful talk ganesh i just wanted to ask what is the expected accuracy with the indigenous clock and does it will it transmit also a 1 pps signal uh, uh good evening madam uh, so uh, the um, the clock does not actually uh, transmit a 1 pps signal basically okay. it is a frequency uh, uh generator so it generates what is called as a 10 megahertz then you uh, you actually synthesize a 320 kilohertz signal with it and make it as a 10.32 megahertz 
so the 10.32 megahertz is multiplied many times and made as the s band signal it is multiplied so many times as made and generated and used for generating the l5 signal also so the l5 signal and the s signal are basically born from the basic 10.32 megahertz signal which the atomic clock uh, generates as far as the atomic clock is concerned the atomic clock has two uh, attributes one is called accuracy the other one is called stability accuracy is if i am asking a clock to generate a 5 megahertz signal how accurately it is generating with, uh, the 5 megahertz signal that's the accuracy stability is if it is generating uh, x megahertz or whatever let's say 5.1 megahertz if it is able to throughout generate 5.1 megahertz then it's supposed to be a stable clock so in satellite navigation accuracy is not uh, very vital but stability is very vital because i am the ground segment is making the satellite ready for satellite navigation at the beginning of zero hours of a day then for the next 2 hours the satellite has to basically propagate it, its orbital parameters and the clock has to be very stable for the next 2 hours so if it is so then the the, the set of information which was brought up linked by the ground segment to the satellite will be usable for the next 2 hours but if the satellite uh, clock is unstable then you 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 know you the satellite is not in a position to be used by the user so here more than accuracy stability is very very important so the stability of the clock uh, as far as the uh, uh, the indigenous uh, rubidium atomic frequency standard is something like 5 parts e to the minus 13 uh, which which is uh, which is over 10000 seconds this specification is comparable or slightly better then the state of the art equivalent clocks which are developed by let's say other vendors uh, european vendors and uh, the uh, uh, the uh, american vendors so really proud to say that the uh, rubidium atomic frequency standard is 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 on par uh, with with respect to the other uh, competitors other uh, state of the art peers uh, with respect to the stability uh, have i answered your question madam Yeah, so five into ten to power minus thirteen over ten thousand seconds is it? That is correct, ma'am. That is absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now I asked this one PPS whether the satellite will uh, just like the GPS transmits one PPS signal for the other satellite, whether nav sat nav nav S zero one series will also be generating that. Ah, uh, the 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 navig present or not. Yeah, I got the question. The Navic receiver though can generate a one PPS on the ground, uh, okay. but the Navic satellites per se do not generate one PPS. The one PPS is inferred by the uh, the receiver. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Supriya, so, you can take up Datta and then Dr. Ramesh. Yes, sir. Datta, sir. Ah, uh, Ganesh. Ah, uh, uh, good afternoon. I I wanted to have one uh, small clarification from you. uh uh that is uh, you, you see we have uh, doing the range measurement from ircdr station laser station and one way ranging station what type of the error it is generating all are same or is there any change if it is the change how we are going to mitigate uh good afternoon sir uh, so we have about uh, 16 one way ranging stations the one way ranging stations are working like this satellite says at my time t i am generating the signal and sending it to you now you are receiving on the ground with the ground time so the satellite send the signal with the satellite's time and on the ground you are receiving it on the with the help of ground time so this is called as one way range so here you have a complication in the sense if the ground clock and the space clock were not aligned then the range measurement could be erroneously misleading so uh, you need a special type of processing to ensure that you estimate the orbits very accurately because there is a clock component also which is coupled in the range so if you use one way ranging measurements from about 15 stations which are well separated and range to a geostationary geosynchronous uh, satellite we are able to get around uh, any on a good day we are able to get around 15 meters of uh, orbit determination error on a bad day we could get something like 20 meters of an orbit determination error compare that with the two way cdma ranging where i send the signal from ground using a atomic clock reference I, the, the signal goes all the way to space hits the satellite's transponder comes down as another signal and then i get it again uh, reference it with the atomic clock that i have on ground so i have a two way range which is referenced by a single clock on the ground and there is no clock component involved 
suddenly and i have a well placed uh, network of about four or five uh, ground stations on the earth i am able to get a sub 10 meter orbit determination accuracy now laser ranging is completely different uh, laser ranging uh, while the disadvantages are you can't do laser ranging on a cloudy day you can't do laser ranging below an elevation of 20 degrees but you, the advantage is the the baseline of uh, separation for example you have a laser ranging station in russia you have something in japan something in south africa something in australia that's a huge baseline of almost half of the world so from such a large baseline if you do ranging of a satellite you could get a very accurate uh, orbit determination plus the ranging accuracy of of laser ranging currently state of the art is millimeters accuracy so if you were to do uh, orbit determination exercise with sufficient measurements only from laser ranging stations which are well placed you could end up having a sub 2 meter sub 1 meter orbit determination accuracy so one way ranging 15 meters two way cd ranging 10 meters laser ranging 1 meter accuracy have i uh, answered your question no no now that is the reason now that error how we are going to mitigate how we are going to come to conclusion uh so um, uh, yeah. one advantage of the satellite navigation system is not all of that orbit error is going to manifest as what is called as the uvre or the user equivalent range error in in a geostationary scenario only 10% of the orbit determination error is actually going to meet, you know manifest itself as the user equivalent range error so if you make an orbit determination error of 10 meters only 1 meter error the user actually is going to experience so that is Uh, that multiplied by your GDOP will anyway be the error. So we have an orbit determination error on a UERE of close to 1.5 meters, and we have a GDOP for the seven satellite constellation of uh, uh, an average of three. Therefore, 1.5 uh, meters multiplied by three gives us an accuracy of 4.5 meters. So this is the accuracy that the NAVIC system is currently uh, getting. Now, how do we plan to improve the orbit determination? we plan to improve the orbit determination by two ways one is make the ranging systems more accurate so we have uh, an indigenous ranging system which is which has been developed by istrac and which is going to be operationalized shortly and the other way to improve the orbit determination is improve the geometry of observation so the first generation all the uh, ranging stations were uh, within the indian uh, geopolitical boundary so today uh, the next generation uh, navic ground segment we are planning to have a wide baseline we could have it in europe we could have it in australia we could have it in uh, south africa so we are basically broadening the baseline of the ranging network so once you observe the ranging uh, process from a ba- big baseline the orbit determination error is bound to come down so we are planning to reduce it to a single digit uh, error okay okay now at present uh, which one you are standardizing with the one way ranging station that is correct oh. okay. supriya take the other question supriya if anybody has otherwise see the time and check with the speaker ramesh sir any comments sir uh, good evening shina uh, sir and ganesh sir ganesh sir it was a very informative and uh, uh, very easily understandable your talk was very nice in fact i am not a an engineer i am a biologist in spite of that i could understand many of the things of navigation system uh, in fact kst organizes many training programs for engineering and science students regularly we will be inviting you on one of these days to deliver a talk on navigation system to students so that uh, they can broaden the horizon of their knowledge in navigation system and some of them may take up research in navigation also in future thank you very much sir you are muted yeah sorry uh, i was told that the uh, the audience would be uh, uh, generic in nature so i tailored my uh, talk in such a way that uh, uh, it is uh, generic and could be assimilated by a variety of audience Uh, but if there are any specific uh, technical questions uh, like dr sita asked i i'll be able to answer that as well but anyway the questions were very knowledgeable and i could see that there is a lot of interest and uh, uh, knowledge in the area of satellite navigation uh, it is a great pleasure for me to have delivered this lecture once again i uh, thank uh, my colleague sreena and uh, ms supriya for enabling this lecture. thank you very much uh, okay uh... 
i hope thank you uh, for accepting our request and uh, really making a well valuable uh, talk and it was quite uh, useful to many people even for isro people also it is quite useful uh, you very very useful and very informative thank you thank you okay we are uh, ending here narahari sir uh, okay very nice uh, ganesh has specified uh, basic concept of navigation what are the things are going on and the new upcoming activities uh, what is the especially for i wanted to check with him that geometry geometry is very important so he is already explained the now they are going processing with the geometry they are determining the geometry that is the crux of the story so finding out the real uh, that is uh, mitigation of the error anyways a few more questions were there now the time is very short i feel we will interact with him and that is a good activities are going on it is very nice thank you thank you sir uh, i think we can end here uh, behalf of all i could like to extend my sincere thanks to our honored speaker mr t s ganesh sir for taking time from his busy schedule to be with us inside presentation have provided us with a deeper understanding of remarkable ad advancement and exploration of satellite navigation i could also like to extend my special thanks to all the participants for active participation thank you one and all